We're taking the old country road back to Gotham, baby. Country roads take me home to Gotham. I don't think it works that way. Cue the music. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Comic Lyric Podcast. I'm Ryan, also known as Comic Stan. I love comic books. My co-host loves regular books. I make him read comic books and then we talk about them in depth. And with me as always is my aforementioned flightless co-host, it's Jamie. Dude, you like tightened that up, bro. I rewrote it, actually. That's good. I did a, I did a what do you call it? I did a pass on my own uh, intro. You took a pass on it. Up a little bit, yeah. yeah, it's good. I it like might, it. It might be that from now on. I like potentially. it. Yeah. I it's, thought that might give you the the roof, the the, the little juice I needed, yes, yeah, exactly, the boost yeah. I needed for the podcast. And then maybe next week it'll be a worse one, and I'll just keep you guessing like constantly. I know. So because we're only halfway through British summer, it's already dark, mm, which yeah. I love. I like the cold. I like Are the we dark. halfway through British summer, or is just British summer half the length of everyone else's summer? I don't know. <laughs> British so British summer is a weird time of the year because we all complain that it's too hot, but we all don't like the cold either. I. Don't I'm I'm half and half. I'm I've I hate when it's too hot, but also I hate when the weather restricts what you can do, if you know what I mean. Yeah, because I like the cold. Yeah, you can't go somewhere and sit outside mm. if it's cold because well, well coats exist. Yeah, but when you're like uh, when you're outside and you're restricted to like I better keep this garment on or I'll be uncomfortable is I don't know, worse than if it was just like an okay temperature, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I hear that. But we complain was we, we complain when summer's not you know over too quickly, and then when the wind is here, you'd think we'd thrive in the winter because like we're built for it. Well, compared to like the rest of the world, I guess. Yeah, we're kind of except the Antarctic. I don't know where I'm going. This and way. Canada. I'm, I don't know where I'm going. And with Iceland. This all, but because I mentioned, and speaking of Antarctica, or whichever yeah. one is the correct one, we're talking about the penguin today. Hey! I don't remember which one's which. Don't write in and tell me. Think, don't correct me. I think penguins live in the Arctic. Is it one is penguins and the other's polar bears? Or do polar bears hunt penguins? I don't know. We should have researched this for, the, <laughs> for this week. <laughs> it would have been a good bit if we knew if we knew what we were talking about. I feel like there's one, the penguins are on one end, and is it polar bears? But then what do polar bears eat? Polar bears are Antarctic. Right. So maybe penguins are there as well? I maybe. swear I've seen like a David Attenborough, I was like, and now the polar bear tears open the penguin and I think drinks the his juices. <laughs> drinks his juices? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the melting ice caps have meant that penguins are in more places now. Oh, let's, let's not go on that subject, so like. But it is also true, I think. We're trying to keep it light and happy with the tale of mobsters and murders and, yeah. you know, and all that Gotham. stuff. And ugly men who look <laughs> like penguins or something. But still get loads of play. Yeah, that's... I've got, I've got so some notes So creepy, on that. isn't it? Yeah, I've got some notes. <laughs> but we're doing the Penguin 2023 series, uh, which was, of course, written by our Lord and Saviour, Tom King. It was. <laughs> Not going to challenge you on that? That's fair enough. Uh, also, art by Raphael... De La Tour. I think that's correct. De La Torre. Maybe. Uh, Mr. De La Torre. Colours by Marcelo Maiolo, maybe, and lettering by Clayton Cowles. Cool. And with this, I think this is an interesting one because it's kind of connected to, like, you don't know any of this. I'm telling you this new as well as yeah. the readers. This is kind of connected to a couple of different things, right? This is off the back of Chip Zdarsky's Batman run, where he made some moves that put the Penguin in the situation where we find him now. Yeah. But also, Tom King writing it, he's actually taken a lot from a little limited series he did a year or two ago called Killing Time, which mm. I loved as a little Batman, like a little isolated Batman story, takes yeah. place early in his career, whatever. And he t has characters he brings forward from that. So it's kind of like, oh, I'm doing Penguin. I'll bring this character I invented two years ago. And the reason I know that is because reading some comments about this comic, I saw people complaining about how he portrayed one of the characters. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's a bloody disgrace what he's doing. They've made this, he's made this character weak. Like, what's he doing taking these and characters? It's his and it's character. Like, and he invented this character like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's, he's the only one who's written for him. It's, it's kind of his. Like, it's whatever he says the character does. I'm um, speaking of the character, The Help, but we'll get into I Oh, the help was fun. Yeah. And overall, what are your thoughts on this? So. Oh, we're getting into it then. Yeah, let's get into it. Yeah. Over, over, let's go overall, broad strokes, non-spoiler thoughts. Then we'll get into the nitty gritty. So, broad strokes, mm. it was a bit of a paint by numbers story. I might challenge you on that a little bit. Not well, a lot, no, but a little bit. So, so think about it, right? He's retired. He's out of the game. And then somebody brings him back into the game for reasons that don't make a whole lot of sense, but that are broadly plausible. 
and then he puts a crew together and then he starts doing jobs. It's very much a heist film. Yeah, so what I should clarify my point, um, and also we are covering just issues one to six of this 11 issue run, I think a perfect little... I only read one to five. Well, I'll tell you about issue six then. <laughs> um, but it's a nice little, like, we tell you about a little bit, and if you like it, you can finish it, because we're basically covering half the story, yeah. essentially. But I... And I think we covered what is probably going to be the least interesting half, because we covered the setup. And I imagine yeah. six to eleven things will hot up a bit. But you would assume so because we meet we meet Batman Junior. You mean Wayne Junior? Bruce Junior. Yeah, Bruce Junior. No, Wayne Junior. Wayne yeah. Junior. Yes, Bruce Wayne. No, it's what's what's his dad called? Uh, Thomas Wayne. Yeah. So we meet. Th- we meet. I think we established that Batman is Batman, but Thomas Wayne is Bat Dad. No, he's Batman Senior. Oh, Batman Senior. Yeah, Batman. Yeah, but is then Damien not Batman Junior? Batman like the Jr. literal son of the June of the, of the I like calling Batman 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 Jr. It just appeals to me. I think most people are gonna think that you're talking about a Robin. And not even a specific Robin, but just, just <laughs> one of the Robins. <laughs> no, I'm talking about Bruce Wayne, Batman mm. Jr. You know Thomas Wayne was brought as a character, was brought in relatively like well, the first time we probably saw him was in that Flashpoint comic, which I'm was aware. in the noughties. So I'm aware. So kind of disregarding some of the older comic book fans that probably may or may not listen to the show. Yeah, they probably don't. I mean, we have we have demographic information. We know who's listening and who isn't. Well, we have, we know <laughs> the the sections of the fan base that were within certain ages, and that's if they even gave the right ages to yeah, their podcast totally. catchers. So who knows? But I the reason I say I think it's I I agree with you that in terms of all of fiction, yeah, and especially for more more modern fiction, it is a kind of by the numbers. I think I've compared it to superhero comics. So superhero comics, I expect more of a oh things are happening, but there, there's but there's a, a antagonist in the background, and then you find out it's all connected, and then they have a big battle at the end. Yeah. So, so our com- protagonist here is really driving the story along. Yes. Like he's making the decisions that are driving the story along. After a certain point, because he gets pulled into, he has the was it the heroes. Uh, yeah. resi- resist the call. Yeah, but he doesn't even get a chance to resist the call. They just kidnap him because they're like they just kidnap him yeah. and lock him in a room. Exactly. Give him a bucket to shit in in three square meals a day. So, despite the the by the numbers, was there anything else to it that you found? Because I've got, I think, a lot more to say about it. So, I liked the ancillary characters. I enjoyed all of the characters that he puts together in his little crew. Mm. Um, Major Victory. Yep. Or Captain Victory. Some major victory, I think. He Silent was, Majority, I liked. Yeah, Silent Majority was fun. Captain Victory was really cool. Um, I would definitely like to pick your brains a bit about Black Spider. Uh, first time properly meeting him, for me. Like, mm. I I know that there are... And Black Spider's the black dude who kills addicts, right? Yes, I'm yeah, pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is in a relationship with Captain Victory, right? No. So I... that blonde guy isn't Captain Victory? No, I don't oh, think so, okay. no. I, I'm pretty sure, unless that's a twist reveal, but I'm pretty sure it's not. Pretty sure oh, okay. they're different names. Right, like, okay. Not real people. names. Um, but no, so I really liked that character. I thought he was really interesting, and I really liked his sort of bit, which is, you know, he's an ex-heroin addict, and he's, his thing is now that he's sober and he's killing addicts. Mm. And he talks about, you know, the way that Batman punches the same way he would have put a needle in his arm. That same feeling of, like, elation and regret. And I was like, oh, well, that's quite powerful stuff. I like that. Um, so I really enjoyed that subplot. Um, I did enjoy seeing the Penguin character go from his more demure retirement in Metropolis and kind of getting back into the game. Mm. And I thought that it was a really fun and interesting approach for a comic book about one of the rogues gallery. I kind of jumped between thinking. So generally overall, I thought as a, if I compare it to all of superhero comics, I thought this was good. Yeah. If I compare it to, obviously, where I'm going to go with is Tom King's general work, I'd say this is probably more mid on the scale of like what I've read by Tom King. Uh, I preferred it to his Wonder Woman. Really? Mm-hmm. I don't... I think I preferred Wonder Woman. Um, it, Wonder Woman is inherently a shenanigan character because she's a, a, was it, an ancient warrior... Yeah. A warrior priestess from Themyscira or whatever. And I like, like my comic books a little less shenanigan so I like this. I see, I don't know, I think the whole Force of July thing was like pretty shenanigan Yeah, maybe. Whereas Wonder Woman to me was like doing the stuff that they, if anything, Wonder Woman was more grounded than I've ever known before in that because they did the whole, 
g- American government versus Amazon's yeah. thing, which I thought was an interesting, like, gl- geopolitical kind of story. Yeah. So, yeah, I know. It's personal preference, obviously. I think this one is probably mid compared to, obviously, like, the top tier Tom King stuff, which we, yeah. we've we read and I've read. Like, it's... Yeah, it's... M- what has Tom King done that I really liked? I really liked his Supergirl, didn't I? Yeah, Supergirl, uh, Human Target. I liked his Human Target. Um, I really liked his Batman run, although it kind of fizzled towards the end. I'm trying to think if we did anything else Tom King. I mean, Wonder Woman is the other big one. Uh, what else have I loved by him? We've done a fair bit of oh, Tom King. Vision and Mr. Miracle, which again, yeah. I've read and I, those are also people's favourite comics kind of level. So. Yeah. So I've got like four like top tier titles that i'm comparing everything else he does to yeah so this is like hey, this is why it's coming out mid compared to like some of the best stuff i think as i said if you compare it to all comics like or superhero comics especially all dc comics one of the better ones absolutely and a fun if you like the penguin character at all hell even if you don't like the penguin character this is something where tom king does or where he reframes an existing character so i took the liberty today um, in between reading this to do a bit of research on the Penguin character because wow. I wasn't familiar with it. I've and, just got his Wikipedia open, but lead lead the charge. Well, I mean, just in as much as, you know, when he kind of came into the comics, what his kind of shtick was. And to be honest with you, I did a dip test of some comics that he appeared in just right. to have a little look at them. I vastly prefer this to all of those. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's, um, he, he was campy. He was kitschy. He was yes. silly. He was always in that silly Penguin suit, which obviously they've jettisoned here for the most part. Mm. They've made his um, costuming, you know, his costume in the comic book, his costuming, that's ridiculous, yeah. um, a little bit more grounded. You know, he's still in the suit, but it's not quite as buttoned up and there's no top hat. He just feels a bit more naturalistic here. And I liked that. Yeah, some character, some of Batman's Rogue Gallery, and I've actually made a video that uh, would, uh, would delved into this a little more details, but... His row gallery, some of them have had kind of redefinitions that have oh stuck God, around. I mean, man bat is fucking ridiculous. Man bat's just a mutated man bat creature, essentially. Yeah, That's weird. one of the more grounded ones. I'm talking about like overly camp kitschy ones that have had so like kind of Riddler. Well, like Riddler has only re- more recently been kind of redefined. Mm. Still does a lot of the stuff he did before. But like Two Face used to be yeah. two-faced nowadays is just a scarred guy who has like kind of um what do you call it schizophrenia dual personality kind of yeah. thing but back in the day he was like everything needs to be half and half all my goons need to wear like mask with the half and half i need to live in a fucking thing with half and half and like giant <laughs> pennies and all that bollocks like he's been redefined joker is more of like a psychomaniac these days then back in the day when he was like uh, literally uh, the clown prince of crime yeah. who like, did robberies and did the squirty flower thing and all that bollocks um but penguin's one who's hard to be redefined because back yeah. then he was like a penguin themed mobster yeah and it's like what do you do with that and i yeah. think they haven't really properly redefined him they've just he's slowly become a bit more not even serious but just more modern day yeah. version back in the day it was all like penguin themed things and penguin and, and, and his umbrellas and oh my umbrellas are helicopter yes, <laughs> exactly. it's really stupid now it's just always a gun and that's that's yeah. the middle ground and it's, that's cool yeah like i you know i mean umbrella uh what's that film the kingsman made umbrella guns cool yes and his is just like quick shot bang dead yeah. like th- we we will get into like what this character what makes this special character nowadays yeah but yeah back in the day i think one of my interest one of the most interesting things top it versions of him i saw was in arkham asylum yeah just generally a mob boss like called the penguin but one of the things they just did about him was instead of a monocle which he used to have he had a like end of a a glass bottle over his eye and it turned out in the backstory the joker had fucking like impaled a bottle in his face yeah and they couldn't remove it like it was like jammed in there and it was like uh, so it was just instead of a monocle, it was like just a bottle, like it's a just been shanked. smashed, yes, shanked in the face, basically. So yeah, I think I I appreciate some of the changes here, but I've got criticism of like how they're executed as well. Before we get into that, what what do you think is the what is the general story of this? Uh, you got into a little bit, but what's the general story of this comic for for anyone who doesn't know? The penguin has been usurped by his kids. Yes. And I gave you, that was the one bit of tidbit information I gave yeah. you before reading. So he's living out a quiet life with his girlfriend in Metropolis. He runs a florist's. He walks in the park every day, eats a hot dog, feeds half of it to the pigeons, goes to the tailors once a month for a new suit. He's living a very quiet life. The police are trying to antagonize him. 
which I think is fu- a fun little tidbit. Mm. So the police keep sending like big scary coppers to try and like start fights with him in the park, and he just keeps avoiding it and being really polite. He is abs- he is captured by somebody from the FBI, I want to say, or the CIA. Yeah, one of them. I, yeah, yeah. And they basically say that what well, we've got your girlfriend, we're going to kill her if you don't work for us. Basically, is and- the rough idea of it. And so he has to go back to Gotham and basically build his crime empire from the ground up again as an old man just when he got out they pulled him right back in and this is it isn't it that's so tropey it is very tropey so i have one massive glaring complaint about it okay you know what it's gonna be oh the swears yes (sighs) we can we can broad we can include this in the the starting with the art in because it's like an aesthetic choice isn't it okay so the art is fine it's dc house style dc house style i the one thing i credit it that i enjoyed that was only a bit different was the violent scenes being that striking red yeah and that in even in itself is not a it's not brand new technique but i, I like enjoyed the it. splash panel of captain victory yeah you know yeah. you see him boxing with um the help yes. and then we get that one big splash panel of him looking re- like it's all gold he's there looking very mus- mu- well muscled in his boxing gloves and i'm like oh that was a really nicely posed well-drawn figure of a man yeah um, and it was a nice splash panel. It wasn't super impactful. It wasn't, you know, anything life changing. But yes. I was like, that is a nice piece of art. It was drawn well enough that I enjoyed it yeah. without any part being particularly memorable. Like, I yeah. think that part was memorable because it was one of the few splash pages, wasn't it? Yeah, totally. In terms of layout, I realized early on, um, first couple of issues, I was like, we haven't had any three by threes. No, we have not had any Tom King three by threes. And then when it got to the convers- like the one-on-one conversations, like there they are. So I don't know if he was being more sparing because he's maybe heard the criticism of overusing that yeah. or if he just is at a point, if he's always just been at a point where he only uses it when it feels they are uh, more appropriate. It's so interesting because for the longest time we thought the three by threes were a Tom King thing. And then when we revisited Watchmen, we realized that it was a, um, what's his name? Uh, Dave Gibbons. Yeah, it was like a Dave Gibbons thing. I think Tom King's definitely adopted it because it's in too many of his titles. Yeah, no, he's definitely adopted it Mm. um, to great effect. Obviously, we we only see it a little bit here. Um, But no, I mean, I I felt that it was laid out so that it scanned well. Again, everything was very serviceable. Yes. I, I, I only have one glaring issue with it, which I'll get into. Um, it was drawn perfectly well. Mm. There was no screaming bad art. There was nothing that really turned me off. There was also nothing that really turned me on. Yes, exactly. And I'm guessing in the glaring issue, yeah, that would be the censored censored swears. Well, yeah. So you long long term listeners will know how I feel about censored swear words, where they just use a series of punctuation, normally ampersands and hashes, to denote a swear word. The problem here is that there's a lot of swearing. There's a lot of sentences which are structured around swearing. And there's a character whose whole fucking thing is that she fucking swears a lot. And I'm like, so I feel that if you are going to do swearing, you need to just do the swearing. If you are in a situation, if you're publishing a piece of material that's intended for an audience that you don't want to present swearing to, you need to not swear. You can't have it both ways. And if you're going to have a character whose whole thing is that they swear a lot, you need to put the fucking swearing in. It, it was so jarring. And there were so many times where the hash marks weren't the actual length of a swear word. Yeah, I couldn't work out what a lot of them were. I couldn't work out what they were trying to yes. say. Yeah. And so at this point, it's kind of obstructing the dialogue Yeah, in a way that really took me out of the story and just made it really hard to scan a lot of the time. And again, I so I'm a very sweary human. Yeah, as we both are. I'm, I'm a, As a variant human, I'm a sweary one. I yes. just am. I've always sworn a lot. I think it's because of where I'm from and, you know, my social class and all that bollocks. The problem is the swears are way too, um, what's the word? You can use them. Here's this perfect example. I have such a limited vocabulary that that's why I swear more. But I can't think of like, they so adaptable. Like you can use them in so many different ways. That's the problem. Particularly in British English. Yes. Particularly in um, the British dialect. Where, Where fuck is a punctuation mark. Yeah, absolutely. But... I am also a bibliophile and I love the written word and I adore the free and happy use of and uh, the free and happy use of language and I love people who have you know heterodox words in their vocabulary and people who are able to manipulate the English language in such a way that they don't need to swear for impact and I pride myself on also being one of those people I think um and so it would have been entirely more impactful for me if 
they had found more elegant ways to convey the aggression and the stoicness and all the different character traits that they're using all the not swear words to convey because they're not even using the swear words. They want to use the swear words, but they don't want to use them. And it's so confused. Yeah. And even more so nowadays where if anything, we've uh, a recent example of um, Deadpool and Wolverine is that the age of people who are fans of these characters, it ranges now because people have gone older while young people still sub, you know get into these kind of things. But you've got enough of a demographic that you could just say, this comic has swearing. It's not, it's 18, whatever. Like, And to be clear, I don't, I don't have a distaste for stuff that doesn't have swearing in it. No. I'm more than happy. I don't need you. I don't need all the characters to be swearing all the time. I'm more than happy to read a piece of fiction that has no swearing. In fact, I love fiction that has no swearing. Um, but this tries to have its cake and eat it, and it's bothersome. Yeah, the it's, censored swears take you out of it. It's truly bothersome. Yeah, and I, I'm. I, this is one of the few areas where I think I had the different. I had the more common opinion. I think that is most people have which is like well they need to appeal to most people to make money so they just censor them like that was like kind of me and you have brought me around on this to you know why bother you don't have to do it that way you can you can challenge yourself and make it more difficult and you know it's more realistic or yeah. just put the swears in either way yeah but yeah i totally agree with you i think that is one glaring issue of tom king's that just happens constantly with the amount of swears he writes in the characters that get censored i want to see a swearing comic written by him i'm like what swears do you, are you actually using yeah. like what are they meant to be in this because there's a few where in my head i put the sea slur in mm. because i'm british and they you know we 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 for our american audience who consume a lot of british media you won't always see the sea slur because it's, you know, stuff is made with the mindfulness that it's going to be consumed by an international audience. I mean, with the hope, especially. Yeah, but it, yeah because it's, the domestic market in the UK is so small that to have a successful property, you really need to get it over the pond. Yeah. But if you come over to England and you sit down in a pub beer garden, which you won't be allowed to fucking smoke in soon, by the way, ridiculous, mm. you will hear the sea slur. You yes. will hear people call each other fucking cunts. Like it's 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 not it's still not polite. I love it's how still you not... censored yourself a while and then just <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah totally. I wanted the impact. Mm. Um, so it's not a word that you would necessarily use in front of your nan, but it's far more prevalent in our dialect than it is in the American dialect. Yeah, I heard an American talk about it, uh, some online somewhere, but an American was talking about it, they were like, oh yeah, they just use it like very liberally over there, uh, like all the time. And I was like, yes and no, because like we use it a lot more than Americans do, absolutely. But they think we just use it in like, like in, in at work, at yeah, your job, like totally that's nowhere not. near that. It no. is a drinking with your friends word. Like yeah. that's how we use it. Exactly. I mean- you, I think what you're referencing is that bit in what, Why the Last Man, where she says cunt is a perfectly innocuous word in Australia and the UK, but only in America would, would we make it offensive. Yeah. And there is a thing to be, that was, that kind of opened my eyes a little bit to the idea that why is that the most offensive word? Probably because it's to do with women's genitalia. Yeah, and, totally. And as a male dominated species for so long, a society, especially we've just been like, oh, dick, cock, balls, like, you know, who cares? Like, that's all fine. It's like, word for vagina oh we're at the dinner table like don't you know like calm down so i think there is definitely like an element of that in there which i again why the last man kind of opened my eyes to a little bit but and, and i think this is probably endemic of the transatlantic or the american aversion to swearing because americans are quite averse to it um and if this was a british comic i'm quite confident that they probably would have been they would have just not edited the swearing out uh again the same capitalistic reasons for keeping for not keeping them in might still apply yeah. for exactly the same reason as you say they even just because it's made in england doesn't mean it has to be only sold in england yeah. in this day and age so maybe back in the day but i think that's probably less true nowadays yeah but it just it just feels egregious to me and mm. it's it turns me off the whole thing yes i completely get that and i think you do have to do a little bit of like self like okay ignore that try and like mm. keep yourself in the story like don't let yourself pick up but you have to like put that effort in almost and that is absolutely something that you and i have to do mm. because we're reading this to a purpose and if i came to you if i turned up to record and said by the way ryan i didn't read the comic because it did the swearing thing that annoys me mm. you'd be like well what the fuck dude we have to yeah. record a podcast about it but if i was reading this for pleasure I fully would have stopped reading. Yes. But when you... and when I you wouldn't have seen it through to the extent that I did. Yeah. Because it annoys me. Yeah. It's really annoying. When you read words on a page, you literally read them in your head. And when you get to that censored word, you have to stop 
you break the flow, yeah. you stop and you have to think, what word goes there? Like you have to solve a little puzzle every time you get to it. And again, I mind it less if they cut a character off with a syllable at the start. Yeah. So if a character goes, fuck, and then it cuts to another panel, I'm like, mm. okay, I know they're about to say fuck. Yeah. That's fine. I can read that. They didn't have to spell it out for me, but I can read it. I know what the character's saying. That's okay. But when we're at a point where the swearing is so central to one of the primary characters that we're introduced to, this CIA agent, mm. and... Who would be part of her backstory. Like yeah, she, yeah, part of her backstory is that she used to swear a lot, and then she stopped swearing, and now after she's met Penguin, she starts swearing again. Yes. Again, I think one of the themes that I did like about this is this idea of cessation, and this idea that... Because it's something that I think has been sorely lacking from Batman comics is this idea that um, crime, like, you know, co comic books perpetuate the myth that crime is a bad thing done by bad people, not a systemic problems created by poor environments. And what this comic does is it shows us lots of characters who are dragged back into things. Lots of characters who are working hard to better themselves, but are being dragged back into old habits. Mm. Penguin retiring and trying to live a quiet life, even though he's, his hand has been forced. Yeah, we, we, I'm, I, wanna, I think we'll get that into that. That woman what swearing and starting swearing again, the addict talking about addiction and the way that that works. I think this is a really interesting theme that's running through this text. Mm. And, I, and personally, I find that theme really interesting, like mm. cessation and you know, habitual behaviors and addiction. I find that all really fascinating. And so to see a comic book that is kind of playing with those themes was fun and interesting but i couldn't go i just couldn't yeah. get past it mate yeah they need to honestly they would need to just release both versions yeah. like do you want the sense of it like because that's the thing with we won't get into this too much long so we want to obviously talk about the comic but all i'll just say is that's the big thing with music censorship is like even artists who have their music censored or have to cr or are asked to create safe radio safe versions of their songs with swearing in. the album version will always be what they originally yeah, intended they say as well uh, but even in modern day the age of streaming and all that like and even back when it was cds and physical cds or whatever it's just give people the choice if you're a parent and you're monitoring what your child listens to which good on you then you get the censored version if they're if they're a fan of this musical act like the, the one example i heard was like tenacious d like yeah their, their songs they made safe versions of their it's songs ridiculous. which is crazy yeah. when you think about it but when they asked they were like someone was like can you believe they're censored your songs they were like no it's fine like you don't always have to hold our hand hard yeah. <laughs> sometimes that's just not right to do <laughs> maybe i've picked the wrong example but, <laughs> but the point is give people the choice like if you want to if you want to sell this this censored version and get, make as much money as possible fair enough and how much difference does it make like in the tweaking of a, of the, the lettering to make a second version no i, I i'm fully I'm, I'm with you i agree with you because it's and it's this conversation about our comic books are or a product and and they skirt the line between the two you know like there's media really well yeah i mean absolutely and i think if you are making an argument for comic books being art you have to make exception for the moments where it's quite clearly not pure artistic expression Mm. Because Tom King had an idea for a character who the central theme of that character is that they're a bit sweary and he wasn't able to see that through. Maybe that was a creative choice that he made, but it doesn't feel like a creative choice. It feels like a concession to a market. Yeah. And that, that to me, it's... Takes away from the experience of the, of the art. Absolutely. Well, it, to, to me, it kind of questions whether or not it is art at this point because it's so mm. compromised. Um, and when you're creating art, I don't think there's necessary. I mean, there's always room for compromise and there's always room for concession, but I don't think that can come in the actual expression of your art. Mm. I think the compromise comes in the creation and the compromise comes in the limitations forcing you to create something better. But this limitation hasn't forced him to create something better. It's forced him to make a compromised product. Mm. If a comic book writer were to then say, right, I can't swear. It's a DC comic. It's made for children. I can't swear. I'm going to have to really like dig deep in my own lexicon to find a way to make the characters express all the things i want them to express without swearing yeah that then is art again for me and i'll tell you what as well it would have been far more interesting if there was that and you had this character who used to swear a lot and is trying not to like in a comic where you know they can't mm. you've got this character who's like seemingly like always always on the verge of it and then maybe you could do the that then becomes funny yeah and then you do the and then it cut like you know she's sworn but you don't have to put it like that would have been 
more interesting. Because we had that moment where she lets loose. Yeah. He leaves the investigation room and she does a big swear and it's just a bunch of hash marks. And I look yeah. at that and go, ugh. Whereas if it was... What a disgusting totem to compromise. And what a it... <laughs> disgusting totem to capitalism this is. If it is. was just the cut, like... And then, like Simpson, that would have been funny. Simpson's home and when he realises he's left off the thank you note for Mr. Burns, she just goes, kids, you want to get out of here? And he goes... And then you, like yeah. the, the birds flying and the bells going. But that's funny. Yes, yeah. And 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 I fully agree with you. A character whose whole thing is that they're sweary, not being able to swear. That's a point of conflict for that character, and that would have been interesting to read. Mm. What we get is bland. It's vanilla. Yeah. And I'll so we don't get anymore. I just want to tie it off with it reminds me of the the real life example of remember the doors when they were told to sense one of their lines. I can't remember what the sensor was, but the real line was like in um. Uh, the, what about fire or whatever but it's like girl we couldn't get much higher and the police were like if you say that you will arrest you and they did and then it reminds me of the simpsons version where they're the red hot chili peppers on crusty show and he's like we want to send you a line so like no way our, our lyrics are like our babies man you can change and crusty like okay but what about instead of what i got i really like to put it in you we could change it to what i'd really like to do is hug and kiss you <laughs> and, and that's, like that's great yeah, that's no, everyone better can enjoy us. <laughs> All right. So, Again, I don't, I don't, I don't think this detracts from our conversation about the comic. Though I think this no. is one of the, this is for me, the conversation I most wanted to have about this comic because I, it's, it's systematic of a wider problem in the genre. Yes, I think what we'll have to do is whenever we do a comic like this with swearing and again, I think from now on we have to be like, we we've said about this already. If you want to hear our thoughts about censored swearing in comics, go to the Penguin episode where we go into it in depth. So we've got this kind of bookmark. Like, go to the Penguin episode, go to the time code. I will time code where we talk about censored swearing. And I think this is what is so compelling to me in fiction is that because fiction now appeals to a much smaller market, books are just more expensive now. Mm. You know, I, I went to pick up Bob Mortimer's new book the other day and it was £22. Yeah. And I'm like, that's expensive for a first edition hardback. But, Physical media, yeah. Yeah, but I'm willing to pay that because I know that I am now part of a much smaller audience for the written word. And I think this is something, this is an issue that, a teething issue that comic books are now having, which is that they appeal to two distinct, or at least their audience has changed. And the people who grew up with comic books as children are now still reading them as adults and want more adult content. And the big two desperately want to appeal to them, but they also still need to make it safe for what they see as their core audience, which is young people. I would argue that actually the core audience for comic books now is people our age who grew up with them and you know are familiar with them. It's the Gen X, it's the millennials, it's yeah. not Gen Alpha. Absolutely. Gen Alpha are watching Skibbity Toilet. Like Gen Alpha are off doing their own thing and that's totally okay. And, um, and so it's sort of, you know, comic books are in a weird place where they don't really know who they're for at the moment. I mean, the thing is, they've always had this problem. Like, it's it's not a recent one, because like, even back even in the in day, the 80s. We, well, even back whenever they had uh, Black Label stuff we've read, with yeah. they, like all the Sandman, when that started off and like branched with John Constantine Hellblazer, that was all like, you can do whatever topics, like not even just swearing, like dark topics and that. Punisher, what his most his most well-regarded series is the Punisher Max series by Garth Ennis, which is horrific in some parts. Mm. But they, even back then, they were like, let's do some adult-focused content. And like, this, yeah. this should have been that. If, if you've got a Tom King writing on something, if it's a DC mainstay character, let him do whatever. Like, because you know he's got a following now. And I, right, I think we've we've covered the swearing thing as for much as we can. Um, the one other thing I want to get no, to... No, this is more interesting than talking about the comic to me. This is way more compelling than any conversation about that story, which, to be frank, is a bit flaccid. Well, I was going to ask you, I think what is an interesting topic is the narration style in this, because this is a kind of unique narration <sighs> style, and I don't know if it's better or worse for so it. So we have an omniscient third-person narrator. But not... No, we don't. We don't. What we have is a series of first-person narrations from whomever, from whomever is in the panel. Exactly. And never the Penguin. Never the Penguin. And, it's, and, and I do... <sighs> Again, we know how I feel about um, sort of invasive narration in comic books. Mm. I like this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This Weirdly, is, I liked it. I, I still find it does the thing of getting across exposition in a mm. tell, don't show way. Yes. But it doesn't, it's not just that because it does also do a bit of ex like giving the inner thoughts of the other character Penguin's dealing with. So it kind of has its cake and eat it too, but because it keeps changing almost per page like some issues it's one character some issues it's many characters but something something that's a prevailing sort of theme of this is that the penguin is a 
corrupting force in all of these people's lives. Mm. And what we're seeing is him through everyone's perspective, because most of that, most of that narration, that expositional narration is their feelings about him, or at least their feelings about them now that he's back in their lives. Yeah. And that to me was interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah, he, the, his other people's reaction to him was like a very common yeah. theme, which I enjoyed. Again, similar, similar to the use that Tom King made of it in that Supergirl story, yes. whereby we were seeing somebody else narrate it, but they were doing so retroactively and they were talking about their experience of Supergirl. Mm. And this is the same thing, isn't it? We've got all of these other characters talking about their experience of the Penguin. Yeah, and my my favorite version, I think I always mention it, I love the human target version because even mm. though it's the main character narrating it, because for me it's such a noir detective story, like that is a staple of that genre. Like that old thing of like, when well, all the bars, why did you have to walk to mine? Like he's not saying that out loud, like that's that genre, isn't it? Did you notice that he does the same thing with Batman that he did in that human target? It, what specifically? Where Batman is being talked about as this force. Well, I got that more for Penguin now, though. Like, we had that in Human Target with Batman. I think that's they've done away more with Penguin now. Yeah, totally. Like, and I, I think we'll get into that with the Oh, main... I see. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. But no, because, but you know, Penguin sort of says, oh, well, I need these addresses. And also, I need to hang out in the suburbs because hopefully he's in the city and I need to avoid Batman. Like, I can't that, get that in the was actually, with Batman. They were talking about Superman then to call them the big blue voyeur. Uh, yeah. Which I is, thought they were talking about Batman. Here's the confusing part. Like, I got that in that moment. I was like, because they're in Metropolis. So yeah. I was like, that, they're talking about big blue. Superman is called the big blue. Like, that's a nickname for him. But then later, when they're, they're talking about Batman, they talk about, oh, him with this blue boomerangs like they talk about Batman like that. it's like are his batarangs blue like I'd, i've always seen them black i've yeah, never I seen always them blue the batarangs were black yeah so i can see like why there might be confusion where the color blue is later associated with batman i i think incorrectly so then you might go like oh when they talk about big blue earlier that was batman mm. i did like batman here i thought yeah. he was cool i mean the opening so let's get into the story like start from the top um we do the classic again i think a noir thing the um the everything's fucked at the beginning and that how it's not even noir it's a common fiction trope isn't it it's, we start off in the terrible situation they're in later probably towards the end and it's you're probably wondering how i got here like yeah so was it was it record scratch freeze frame like that's me you're probably wondering how i got there like, like let's go, yeah, yeah let's go back three weeks or whatever so we start off that but it is interesting because batman seems to be in a dire situation mm. i will credit with this it does seem like Batman's always in dire situations and he just gets out of them. Like Chip yeah. Zdarsky, re like recently last year, did Batman was stuck in space with no spacesuit. <laughs> and he got out of it. Do you, want cool. to know, do you want to know how he got out of it? How did he get out of it? He managed to re-enter Earth's atmosphere using, I think it was like a pressurized, he had like a can or something. So he yeah. used that to pre pu push him towards the Earth and then he used his cape to like resist some of the the physics of that almost makes sense yeah i guess but he would but he would burn himself alive on re-entry though yeah i feel like they did all this and i read it and i i wasn't a fan of it mainly because i just thought initially like just have him have a thing that calls superman like a, <laughs> like a little a, emergency beeper I like mean, they're buds aren't they exactly and i know batman's like he hates asking for help whatever but i feel like that would have been that would have been a lot more understandable like preparing for every situation like hey i've got a beep i've got a beeper on my belt that calls superman in case I, whenever i really really fucking need him. and you know a lot of it's um, more modern iterations of superman have him constantly monitoring his friends yeah well and so he can he can hear bruce's heart rate yeah two people specifically the voices bruce wayne and lex luther yeah for some reason not lois lane no. <laughs> but also i think i think that's the thing where lois is like you better not be listening out for me like i can handle myself <laughs> so maybe it's that well, yeah, she dealt with his Kryptonian cum, like... Uh, do we leave that in? Oh, we do. How do we deal with it? Well, it didn't kill her. Yeah, there was a lot of concerns that it would kill her. Oh, no, no, we can't leave, we can't leave that in. <laughs> Poor Peter. Poor Mary Jane. We're not too much Spider-Man reign. Like, <laughs> yeah, as far it's as so we know, bad, Ryan. As far as we know, Kryptonite or whatever is not radioactive to humans. Yes. Just to, just su him. Just to Superman. But, um... Yeah, the, we open in the situation and Batman, it's written in a way it describes as like, wow, this is a really difficult situation. Maybe Batman won't get out of it. Like, I felt mm. like it was it was strong enough writing there, which I almost kind of fell into this. Yeah. Maybe, it, maybe he won't. Because he talks about like the 
the the systems are shut down and the backup systems are shut down yeah. and that backup system so that means the whole thing shut down which means we're fucked yeah and i there was one line that i really liked like again tom king's is like little lines of dialogue which really get me and it's batman talking about how fucked his hand is and he says my hand he's trying to get lift his hand yeah. to break the window he's like my hand gets my desperate message and politely declines to help yeah and i thought that was such a good little like it doesn't read like Batman, exactly. but it is a nice line. Yeah. And you cut to that, and then we're just straight into the story. Retired Penguin, like, just living his life. I, this is the point, I think, as a general thing I want to address. I think he goes a bit overboard with kind of exaggerating how fearful of people are of the Penguin. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? I, the level I liked, the level I think I hit here just right was the, the tailor. Taylor yeah. says something like, "Oh, you've you're you're in better shape now." And then like, "Oh no, I've just said the penguin used to be fat." And he's going through all this like, "He's gonna kill my family," and well, and that just gets across like, "This is what the penguin's known for." But then that hench policeman physically pissing himself, a bit much. Yeah, exactly. And then he takes it like that in uh, alone, like henchman, like not near henchman. He was like a fucking soldier, like a, a officer soldier, yeah. and he's like. He's doing a brave job by insulting the penguin. It's like, look, I get... <sighs> so I thought of this when it came up, right? Do you remember... This sounds like a weird tangent. Follow me, right? Do you remember Joe Pesci and Goodfellas? <laughs> yeah. So there was a thing... His character is... he. People fear him. Yeah. And there was a... The only reason I know about this at all is there was a joke in Family Guy, like, years later, where they had Joe Pesci come on and they made him comically short. And Peter goes, like, this is what they thought a tough guy looked like in the 90s. Like, lol. And I thought, like, Family Guy just missed the point entirely. Yeah. Because the point of Joe Pesci's character in Goodfellas is, it's not, he's not tough, he's not strong, he's not well. It's that he could do anything in any moment. And I think this is where my problem comes in with that. Because what made the Penguin so terrifying was the reach that he had and the power that he had. Yeah. We've established that he no longer has that reach and that power. He's been stripped of those things. Mm. His children have usurped him. He's no longer... A, a big time crime boss he's searching for that and so actually i think it would have been far more impactful as a story to start him off in a position where people were able to insult him now because I, he's not that powerful anymore he doesn't have that level of reach he I, doesn't have his goons he doesn't have his crime syndicate he is no longer that powerful yeah if your if your power is derived from others and what you can get others to do for you unquestioningly once you no longer have that you no longer have power and he doesn't have any power at the start of the comic yeah, I think... All he has is his top-notch brain. <laughs> yes. I think... I appreciate the tailor being scared of him, even if he knows his situation. Well, he's because, always known him. Yes, but it's it's not just whether the person has the power and the capability. It's that they, if they ever get it, they will use it to ruin your life. So it's not so... Like, I think I appreciate... That's why I like the tailor's level of reaction. He's scared, even if he doesn't... Even if he knows the penguin's retired, he's like... I, like it doesn't matter. Like, it's that kind of thing of like... If you're scared of a person, it's like, don't worry, he hasn't got any weapons on him. It's mm. like, yeah, now, yeah. like, you don't know how the person holds a grudge. Like, by the sounds of it, the penguin is doing shit to people for barely anything. Yeah. He's like killing their entire families. So you don't want to be like, well, yeah, but he's useless now. Like, he's no fear. But the whole pressure thing, the, ring, the reason I bring that up is, if you're talking to someone, you can be scared of them, not because you think they're stronger than you or tougher than you ever, but just the fact that you think someone will against society's conventions will be in jump immediately to violence mm. that's scary because even if you think you could take someone for lack of a better term the fact that they might pick up a utensil and stab you in the eye like, yeah it's not about oh i could take him in a fight it's like it's not a fight it's someone like what's that it? unpredictable the unpredictability of just a media violence and how com more comfortable they are to do it yeah you know? and that's why i think they're that's the line that you should go for with the penguin. But when we get to like officer who knows who he is and is prepared and is in the you know, the open and can see he is an armed and that kind of thing, like then he pissed himself afterwards. So like that's a bit too far. And again, I think we have a really nice example of it being done well with the help who is not afraid of him. No, because the help is aware that his power was derived from him and people like him. 
And so he's sort of saying, I mean, he he bends to his will, and that, I think, is really establishes the Penguin as somebody to be afraid of. Mm. But he wasn't afraid of him. Yeah. The one character as well who takes even further is Amanda Waller. Did you yeah. recognise Amanda Waller here and know what she was from? No. So she's the, the Suicide Squad woman, or Task Force X. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So cool. when she talks about, again, even higher, like, had an issue with this, she talks about, like, I've had gods kneel before me yeah which there have been in suicide squad like if they can get a superpower person if they can get a bomb in their brain they're on the you know they're on the t- task force yeah so i get her being like oh i've had gods kneel before me and stuff but it's like but even i'm still a bit scared of penguin i'm like yeah. come on like you've had bloody zod on the suicide squad like he's literally <laughs> evil superman like penguin's a guy like i i think they overdid it He's a guy way. with an affinity for penguins. Well, I think he just looks like a penguin and people just kept calling him penguin, didn't they? So with regards to the help, that's the second issue, isn't it? What did you think of that story? Because I think that's a really interesting one as well. <sighs> I, I should also mention the help in that Killing Time ish, uh, limited series. The help trounces Batman. Really? Like, yeah, yeah. But Batman's like very early on in his career. Like he's just starred. And the help's an old gun, isn't he? The help is an interesting one because they... they, they actually hinted at why he might why he is like he is because they mentioned his dad and the pits and i think that's a reference to ray al ghul so i think that the help has been born of side of ray al ghul and has some of this like longevity and immunity that ray right, has okay. and has longevity to train and you know uh what they call legion of shadows or whatever yeah. the name was but yeah little tidbit but the story what do you think of the story of penguin kind of winning him over i enjoyed it in the same way i enjoy the scene in the house in inglorious bastards it was a tense conversation mm. which i enjoyed and you didn't know even what was going to happen next no no, I mean, I was expecting the Penguin to get his ass handed to him, if I'm being honest with you. That's that's the story beat I was expecting, and it's not what I got. I did have to think a little bit about why the help accepted the offer to work yeah. for Penguin, because he obviously didn't need the money. We no. established that very early on. I do think it's an interesting one. I'm not, I still don't know if I like it or not, but mm. it's, it's interesting that what Penguin establishes is he tricks the help, mm. even though the help kind of breaks his nose at one point, but it turns out that was planned. But he poisons the help, yeah. kills all his 28 staff, yeah. and then beats the shit out of him while he's kind of drugged. Yeah. And the point is, it's not, I can beat you anytime. Like, because, you know, the, as soon as, if, the, if he leaves the help alive, which he needs him for, the help will just kill him immediately afterwards. So it's not that, it's you got soft because you, uh, you got yourself in a position where you allowed me to take advantage of you. Yeah. You got soft because of this life you're living, this retirement you're living. So you need to come work for me to regain who you were yeah. and be strong again. Yeah. And I like that. I I guess it makes sense. I, I don't like it. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. I, I reconcile whether I like it or not. Yeah. I just, uh, again, it's all a bit convenient, isn't it? Yes. And it's the, what they're trying to get across about the penguin beyond his propensity for violence and everything is he seems to have this thing of being able to read people. Yeah. Like, and this as one Which thing is I, a powerful skill. Mm, and it does get overused a bit in tell, like fiction, generally yeah. modern fiction. It's like he reads people like a book and knows yeah. exactly what the, it's always the really convoluted plan. She's like, I yeah. knew you'd do that. And I actually planned for it, which actually we will get into in another nice issue. <laughs> yes. And again, we'll, we'll get into that in a later issue. Uh, but in terms of like, how he portrays himself as well and knowing what people think of him i think one bit that exemplifies that is when he's in the interrogation in the first issue and they talk about the other rogues yeah or batman's rogues and they was it someone asked him i oh i thought you were the smart one of batman's rogue gallery and he goes no no edward was the smart one edward being the riddler and it says harvey's the just one that's poison ivy and mm. Um, no, sorry, Harvey, bloody hell. Pamela's poison ivy. Harvey is two faced, the just yeah. one, justice, and all that. Pamela's the passionate one, a poison ivy. Victor's the cold one, Mr. Freeze. Jonathan's the scared one, scarecrow. And Raish is the militant one. And Joker is the obviously the crazy one. And then when they ask, oh, fascinating, which one are you then? And he says, I'm the fat one with the umbrella. And I think that is a really good little, like, yeah. he, the reason he survived for so long as a relatively underpowered, under capable compared to these other supervillains 
is people are underestimating him. Yeah. And he's kind of apparently just slunk by while Batman's taking on like the Joker for the fate of Gotham or Bane and like, or, you know, Riddler's bombs or whatever. He's like, I'm just doing like mob boss crime on the side here. Like he doesn't realize how much I'm actually doing. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting take on the character. But getting into the later issues, um, because we do, there's an interesting structure of like one story per issue, but all building to this larger story. So issue three just sort of is him assembling a crew. It's the... It's dull. It's the, you son of a bitch, I'm in. Yeah, it's so boring. I think the overall story, I agree with you, but I did like some of the specific Force of July characters. Now, I'd never heard of the Force of July. I yeah. looked them up. Apparently, they were first introduced in 1984. Okay. I've no I. I can't see like if they how much they've been used since then or not i wouldn't be surprised if tom king literally just saw them in 1984 and went i'll put them in a comic one day yeah and now he's just found the place to put them in so i don't know anything about the characters going into this i i it is that kind of weird thing of like you know like fourth of july well we're called force of july and we're all kind <laughs> of puns on american yeah. idealism but not even like proper ideals like Razors? Yeah. Like one's called Mayflower. She's kind of a Poison Ivy character. It's just because the ship was called the Mayflower. Yeah. So it's like a, almost a PR thing of like, yeah. yeah I, it's dumb. <laughs> but how he interacts with each character, I did find more interesting. Mm. He appeals to each character in a very specific way. Like you mentioned the boxer earlier on, and he has to help like fight him and yeah. basically show him, like, you ain't nothing now. Like, but if you come with me, maybe you'll get your powers back and you'll be strong again. Yeah. The character who is a teacher who I think his name was Sparkler or something. Yeah. But that was an interesting one because he, Penguin had kind of bribed everyone else with what they want. Yeah. And for him, he was just like, you are normal civilian now. You don't need anything for me. So I'll kill your sister unless you work for me. Yeah. And I appreciate that it kind of changed that. He knew like, I've got nothing else for her. So I'll, so I'll resort to taking something away. Because Mayflower, he got just by saying, I can introduce you to Poison Ivy. And again, he avoids any kind of uncomfortableness. He, do yeah. he, do he knows that is the last resort and he manages to find whatever the thing is before then to the not sour the relationship with the yeah. person. So he's like, oh, you like Poison Ivy? I know her. Like, she owes me a favor. Do you want to meet her? Yeah. Um, one woman just wants money yeah, and just listens to her get drunker progressively and she goes, so do you want money to work for me? She's like, yeah, all right then. Yeah. Um, you son of a bitch, I mean. Yeah, literally every time, apart from the teacher guy and Silent Majority, who I thought was very interesting. Yeah. He turns out he could multiply himself. Yeah. And we've seen, well, I've seen, I don't know about you, we've seen, I've seen characters who can split and multiply themselves, right? Yeah. And normally that's just it. And maybe they're a bit of a quirky character or whatever. This is one of the first times I've seen like, what mental toll would that have on a person? Mm. And it turns out like in this case, they have no sense of self. Yeah. They literally think every other person might be them. Yeah. Are you also, me? <laughs> yeah. And there's also multiple people within him. Cause at yeah. one point he has to like answer so a role call. He's fighting himself, isn't he? Yeah. And answer a role call. It's like, I'm here. And I'm also here. Yeah. And I thought that was a really interesting thing to, again, Tom King, he likes to like take a new kind of look on a character, you know? But again, that is a very much a, you son of a bitch, I'm in assembling the crew kind of thing. Yeah, totally. And we do get two issues of this kind of heist-esque. Ugh, yeah, yeah it, it's dreary, isn't it? Issue three and four are quite dreary. Yeah, I appreciated three more again because I liked how he was interacting with his individual characters. Issue four is very is almost a heist parody issue isn't it like he's it starts off with an interesting bit in the beginning where he he's on a flight and he's visibly very nervous mm. and it seems like he's um scared of flying yeah i thought that was going to be a great little tidbit yeah. for the character the the man who is the flightless bird is scared of flying yeah and then it turns out is because he's going to see his ex-wife who yeah. he it's just really scared of seeing again yeah because she i mean yeah, so we need to deal with we need to deal with the fact that like the penguin is getting a lot of play in this comic book. Yeah, I just made a note of that very simply as a unfortunate trope in modern media where mid to ugly men seem to have these insanely hot women they constantly getting with. It's the sick is the American sitcom parody of like yeah. you and her huh? like yeah, and you never if ever rarely see a Brad Pitt slash Channing Tatum character with a not going to name a specific example woman, but just a mid-looking woman. Like, you never see that, do you? No. And that is a bit of a sexist uh, aspect yeah. of uh, Hollywood, isn't it? Because all the women in Hollywood are 
pretty much to a man insanely attractive. Exactly. And I think I would appreciate if the woman that he was with in his retirement was more of a, just a normal looking person. Yeah. But I, I was fine if this crazy Vegas mob leader woman was looked how she looked. Because yeah. she looked like she fit the character. Yeah. The nice woman should have been like maybe similar stature and, you know, build to him. And like just a, <laughs> yeah, just a nice person. And that would have even driven it more for him like doing all this to save her. Yeah. Because seemingly that's what he's, you know, doing this for. Yeah. But we get this being with the ex-wife and it's very much a, I, we have to assemble this whole plan and it's telling you how it's all going to go. And then, oh no, it hasn't gone how it's meant yeah. to. Um, the starts with the helps, like you slit her throat when I laugh, because they have a laugh about something I can't remember now. And then it just all goes to shit there. And then it turns into the ex-wife being like, I knew you were good. I, I yeah. heard when you got into the airport, we tracked down the team that you were using. We found the one most likely to turn on you, offered him some money, and he did. And now shoot you several times, but it turns out that I knew where the less lethal places yeah. to shoot you were. And in a week, yeah, this was a mess. This is the most convoluted, probably bit of writing I've ever read of Tom Yes, yeah, it's not great. It was not good. And then after that, it gets even worse. Because then he speaks to his ex-wife and like convinces her to yeah. like join him. And then she, so it turns out she was the one who turned, no, she gave his children the means and plan by which to usurp his empire, right? Yeah. And then it turns into like, oh, I didn't do that because I hate you. I did that because to show you how weak you were and yeah. how strong you like just really it's all it's all convoluted. awful and again this is why I wasn't super keen to get into talking about the story because it's just kind of a bit of a mess yeah and I'm only I'm, I want to talk about why it's bad like why like why it's a mess well it's a mess because it's a mess it's a mess because it's um a com it's a it's a confusing mess of a situation with characters who don't have strong um reasons for being there yeah and yeah, that's and the thing. It's the Rick and Morty, like, I knew you were going to do that, so I actually planned a contingency. It's like, no, I knew you were going to plan a contingency, so I planned this, and it just becomes that, doesn't well, it? Well, it's exactly what it is. It's yeah. exactly what they're, they're taking the piss out of. Yeah, because it literally, Penguin's like, oh, yeah, I had, to, I had to get into this situation with a ruse of a failed attempt to kill you to get you to this position it's yeah. like but no did you like that you haven't achieved anything it has all of the charm of two grandmasters dissecting a game of chess with none of the intrigue yes exactly because it's just like i knew you do that oh i knew you do that and then like the it most egregiously towards the end it's like oh the help he had to get beaten up by your henchman yeah but as part of that ruse he would only do that if he got to kill the henchman afterwards for yeah. his own pride so you know i told him he could do it afterwards so it's like it's just even more of like a i planned all of this to happen yeah N you know nothing <laughs> nothing has surprised me just we've wasted the audience time with this like that's what it yes was. thoroughly and then it jumps into the subplot with the black spider yes and that is an issue on the Black Spider issue did kind of bring me back in. Like, I was quite low on this after the, the Vegas issue. And because immediately you just start off with this character who's working for the children of Penguin, who we yeah. see for the first time in this series. And immediately I'm just like, oh, he's talking to someone. It's probably Penguin, but he's not shown. Mm. And I think that little bit of like, well, he, he must be talking to Penguin. He's, he's addressing the Penguin. Yeah. But we're not seeing the Penguin. And it's the nine by, it's the three by three, yeah. nine grid. So I'm drawn into it a little yeah. bit. And then we get a fairly interesting character and yeah. story. Do you want to touch on that at all? Because it, it, that was one of the parts you actually mentioned towards the beginning. So he he mentions that he killed his dad, who was an addict, mm. and that he's a former addict, and that he is killing addicts. And it's he basically having a conversation with the penguin about addiction and the nature of addiction and the fact that, you know, I think there's a prevalent sense that you can be cured of addiction. With their abstinence. Well, they were talking about he was at one point killing addicts, and it yeah. seems he's probably he's not doing that as much. No, because he jokes about like they're both smoking cigarettes, and yeah. Penguin's like, "Oh, you're gonna kill me for being that." He's like, "Ah, no, no, I'm not really doing that now." <laughs> like, no, but it's 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 a conversation about the nature of addiction and habitual behaviors, and it was just very telling and very interesting. Yeah, and especially getting into why he killed his dad mm. or how that happened. Um, he was robbing a shop as a uh, as like a yeah at the time high you know junkie essentially and 
heard someone call his name, shot the person without even thinking because it was just recognizing him doing a crime and it turned out to be his dad. So you think at the beginning when a bad guy or a, you know, anti-heroic person talks about killing the dad, you imagine like big epic fight mm. or something where he's overcome or bested and maybe he's taken the mantle of yeah. Black Spider. Turns out, no, it, it was just a really tragic accident. Dark, depressing, real life-esque kind of thing. So I yeah. think that was a good twist. I think the story of slowly revealing the character's uh, love interest, who is a man who is needing a... Uh, well, it's revealed to be like to the what's it called venom, which is Bane's thing, which makes him big. Yeah, he has some disease which this venom seems to help with. Yeah, and it's no surprise that this is like an illegal substance because it's literally the stuff that makes Bane massive yeah. and like a Hulk basically. So it's interesting. There's there's an illegal substance that um, it needs to be used medicinally, and he has to commit crime to get it. And again, that comes to like. Is it that he's doing it for no reasons or is he just addicted to the lifestyle yeah. and maybe there's other ways that could help this kind of thing? Again, when I was looking at comments of this, I saw comments of like, oh my God, they turned Black Spider. Like, the, the they Chris, turned Black no, Spider no, gay. The criticism I saw, it was worded quite funny where he said, oh, they haven't, because he gets beaten up a lot in this. Yeah. And it's like, oh, they're having Black Spider get beaten up. Like, they're ruining the character. And I was like, all right, I can, I can debate cool. you on this. He goes, and they made him gay. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake. Like, oh, just disregard <laughs> everything you say now. Yeah. Like, Jesus Christ. He gets beaten up a lot, but it's because he's act actively saying a thing. He's got a blade in his shoulder and he's like about to use it. And we don't see him use it yet, but he's like about to take them out for the penguin. Yeah. And so I think that was an interesting kind of line as well. A little interesting thing, which I found was he's beating up like a Riddler gang at the beginning. Mm. Turns out they don't work for the Riddler but non-supervillain gangs are wearing supervillain stuff yeah. to make other criminals think they're working for someone powerful. Yeah. And then comes out with the, was it, what's only useful when it's broken? And he comes in, and the swear would have made it a lot better. I think he says, a fucking egg, you idiot. Or something <laughs> like that. So a fun little bit would have been improved with the swearing, yeah. as we've addressed. But again, that, I think, drew me back into the story. Yeah. Um, and then the issue you didn't read, issue six, was a really interesting issue is about Penguin, how he got started. Right. Okay. So I'll tell you about it, but essentially it's him starting out working for the Falcone family and as a, like a bartender and he's nice and he's smiling and he gets drinks thrown at his face because people just hate how he looks. And then he's got this mother character like a crazy woman who with pigeons yeah who's constantly just refers to him as the boy right and it turns out it's not his mum but not his actual like a foster mum yeah and she constantly makes reference to like she's like get away from me you want to give me dirty kisses Ooh. and he's yeah and he's like oh what the Ew, brother. <laughs> and then he is you know constantly made fun of and mm. disrespected by this falcon group and then it turns out that his mum or foster mum sees says about seeing the batman yeah and it's like early days, Batman. So he goes, he leaves a note for the Batman to find him. And he basically becomes an informant for Batman. Oh, the Falcon okay, cool. family. And then it turns into, starts off. So is he younger than Bruce Wayne then? I think they're similar age. That's weird, isn't it? Because yeah. he looks like an old man. Yes, he looks, he looks much worse than his actual age, I think. They make him a bit more like... Was like, like, was it puppy eyes kind of thing? Like, he's like looking up to yeah. people, like, ah, oh, like he and he's smiling, so he looks younger just based on those kind of aspects. But it's an interesting story because they form this kind of relationship of that him giving Batman more and more information. Mm. And Batman, as and this is from Batman's perspective, it's like, I start coaching Penguin into like being able to find more information and right. read people better and that kind of stuff all of the skills it ends up using to form a crime syndicate exactly mm. yeah and then it builds up to this point of is this canon well yeah yeah this is i mean this is an offshoot from the chip Zdarsky batman run and well, no, that's I mean, the main one is there a precedent for this in past comics? i don't know i think this is new yeah, but like okay. this is the new canon essentially yeah and, and and i'm cool with that it's just i was just interested to see if this was a, a continuation of an existing trope with the character you know the problem is is there's there's so many origins so it mm. could be calling on an existing one but that existing one could be one of many so it's like you know it's choose your own story essentially choose which, your own adventure choose your own adventure which is interestially what joker said about his backstory once when asked about it because someone was like didn't you do this thing from alan moore's the killing joke and he's like i prefer to think of my origin is choose your own adventure that's cool yeah but um yeah it turns into it gets to a point where Bam is like look you gotta give me falcone like the main guy mm. and 
Oswald is like, what happens to me afterwards? Like, mm. I can't work for anyone else. Like, he literally says at one point, it's like, Wayne Tech aren't hiring a guy like me. Like, and I can't mm. work anywhere else because I'm allergic to fries. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> the literal thing he says. And then it gets to the point where he's like, look, like, just help me out and I'll help you out. Kind of like, give me the main boss guy and I'll make sure you've got a place to do, you know, to exist in afterwards, a mm. place in the world. And he gives him Falcone, like, and then when Falcone's gone, Batman, I don't know how he does this in terms of the financials, but he basically signs over, gets, buys and gives the Iceberg Lounge, which is where he works at. The club. To the Penguin, yeah. yeah. And then after Because it's, it's been a part of his backstory multiple times that he runs the Iceberg Lounge. Exactly. And that that's a way back in the origin. Like, he's always in been the... In the 80s. Ice, yeah, he's always been the Iceberg Lounge Yeah, guy. it came into the character in the 80s. I read it today. Yeah. And it's interesting that, like, you would think he would name it that for yeah. obvious reasons, but in this instance, it was the Iceberg Lounge before he got it. Yeah. But then, yeah, he he gets it, and then he's talking to his mum at the end, because he's like, hey, I all worked out, I got this thing, whatever. And he's talked to this crazy woman, like this foster woman who barely knows who he is, whatever, and he's lead, he's on the rooftop with her, with the pigeons. He says, like, it was, you worked out so well, because I needed you, because I needed him to think I was doing this for because he says about taking care of this woman. Yeah. He said I needed him to believe this was all for, you know, real reasons that he would know because he worked out. Like it's bad. Yeah. And he's just super he's say he's a vagina. Like he wants he wants good, you know, yeah. Do things yeah, for good yeah, reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she has like and the woman's like, Well, I I'm helping you. And he's like, no, no, no. You helped me. And he pushes her on the off the roof. <laughs> oh, so oh, there he goes oh, like oh. is he's is he the question becomes, and like we were saying before, it's like addiction and that kind of stuff. It's like, are you a product of your environment or are you a bad person, really? Yeah. And I think that really gets across the idea of Penguin. It's not that he's a, he is a victim of a circumstance and who, how he was born and everything. Mm. But at a certain point, he's just choosing to be evil. He's just choosing to be a terrible human being. And, and, and I like that in a character. I like a character who's just very evil. And that bit, uh, what I said before about what do we think the reason is for his actual retirement? Well, it's because his children have taken his empire from him, right? But do you, could he not go somewhere else? And also, I'm not, I'm not proposing like a solid answer. Like, I think this is a debate that the, the comic actually wants the reader to have. Yeah, and I suppose that is the central question of it, isn't it? Mm. Is, you know, was, was he doing this because he had no other choice or is he doing it because he enjoys it? Because on the one hand, could he not just do a criminal empire somewhere else? Like, and, and, he, and he maintains that he didn't enjoy his work. He was just good at it. Like, could he do it in Metropolis? Because yeah. Superman isn't really busting mobs. Like, he's dealing with no. alien invasions and giant mech robots Lex Luthor built and stuff. Yeah. But does he want to? And then it comes down to, is he just kind of out of the game and he's fine with being out of the game? Or, and there's, there was one little good bit, when he's talking to his ex-wife issue, he says, yeah, like, I can, you, you're doing all this in Vegas, but you want to get back to Gotham. Because yeah. nowhere compares to Gotham City. Yeah. It's like the sins of all mankind just all gravitate towards this one shining city of sin that is Gotham. Yeah. He's doing this to convince his ex-wife. Is it him just revealing his, his actual, own wife? His true motivation. Yeah. And then what could you say about a character who's nice if they can't get the one thing they want, which they will do very evil things for, you know? Yeah. And I think that's an interesting topic that I think is is woven quite subtly across these issues. Yeah. And potentially maybe the next issue then just... Completely like, ruins it. Well, is that more just like breaks open and gives it to you on a plate where it's like, yeah. this is what he meant the whole time. But I think generally I would be interested to read more. I probably will finish mm. this. I don't get affected quite as much about the swearing oh, censorship as you do. Me. But I, I totally understand why you do. Yeah. But I think I would finish this. I think I yeah. would uh, like to see where this goes. I didn't hate it. I mm. didn't. Overall, I didn't dislike it. Even though I found a lot in it that was dislikable, I didn't entirely dislike it. Mm. And for something that is, on the one hand, written by a great comic book writer, mm. but on the other hand, is much closer to the traditional yeah. superhero comic, I think that's... And it... it, it toes an interesting line yeah definitely and i'll finish it and i'll let you know if it's good or not and if well, it's yeah worth this, you i'm gonna use you as a barometer if you like it i might have a go exactly <laughs> but i think unless i have anything else in there and i do not think i have anything particularly interesting other than the joker nod the one little easter egg yeah. that i'm mentioning out of typical conversation because one of the tips that penguin gives batman so yeah you didn't see this one of the tips he gives him 
is for one of the Falcone gangsters leading a um, robbery on Ace Chemicals. Oh, well, that would said, be the Joker, wouldn't and it? And he says one of the like got all of the goons except for one who fell into a vat of acid. Couldn't find him afterwards. Right. And as a reader, you do the Leo DiCaprio meme of like, oh, I yeah. re- I know what that means. Oh, I know what that's that is. referencing the Killing Joke. Exactly. So yeah, other than that, I think that's pretty much covered it, isn't it? Amazing. Do you want to t- touch on any other topics? Did no. you learn about penguins at all or flightless birds? I learned nothing about flightless birds from this. Fair enough. I think I learned more from Birds of Prey than I learned from this. And that was a great comic as well. Really good. Do you want to, should we uh, talk about what we're doing next week? For, I don't know what we're doing next week. I've got a suggestion for okay, what we could do next do week. Uh, do you want to cover the Ultimate X-Men? It's yeah, cool. X- I've never I've never done any X-Men. Let's it's, do it. So it's a very different kind of X-Men. Yeah, it's the Chip Zdarsky one, isn't it? Uh, Jonathan, it was, so it's in Jonathan the Jonathan Hickman, Hickman it's, yeah. but it's written by an art, uh, writer called Peach Momoko. Yeah, I mean, you've 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 been raving about it to me for a while, so I've not actually read it yet. I have been raving about the Ultimate Universe, which right, is yeah, the yeah, new yeah. universe that's kind of overseen by John Thinkman, and is in the same world as the Ultimate Spider Man. Yeah. read. But just to give you an idea of it, and anyone can look this up. This is the front cover of it. Oh, cool! Yeah, let's read that. Yeah, that so, sounds like fun. You heard it here first. A little clue for next week. We're doing well. Clue. It's not a little clue. Told, told you. We're doing Ultimate X Men. So if you want to read some of that and get on board for next week's episode, there you go. So thank you for listening. We have started a discussion thread on Facebook. Come hang out. The Facebook page kind of needed to be rebooted for unfortunate reasons that Facebook just didn't like how I set it up originally. So yeah. it's there, but it wasn't there. Now it's there again. Yeah. So there's a Facebook page. Um, I would like to hear from you all. So come talk about the episode. Talk about the comic. Talk about anything. Um, you can post to the page, I believe. Yeah, yeah, you can post, you can like, and all that. All yeah, that stuff. so just come and hang out and, and chat to us on Facebook. That's weird. I mean, it's 2024, and I'm trying to get people to come to come Facebook. Come find us online. Yeah, come find us to on be Facebook. Fair, Facebook is coming back a bit. I think it's it's being used more nowadays because I think people have fled Twitter. And yeah, I think it's it's people are wanting to diversify like what social media they use. But at least in our age group, I don't know about Gen Z. Yeah, I don't know what Gen Z. Well, Gen Z are kind of our age group now. I don't know what Gen Alpha are up to. Yeah, Gen Alpha are on TikTok, I think. Like the thing is, we work with Gen Z now. So we know what Gen yes. Z are up to because they were in the office with us. Yeah, Gen Alpha <laughs> on TikTok and Instagram, I think, still. I don't know. I, I don't know, know what Gen Alpha are up to, mate. Um, but good on them. We love them. Yeah. We, we, don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. Do you know what? I don't want to be Gen X and just poop on them the way that Gen X did with us. So you go, guys. Or even worse, the boomers. Oh, fuck the boomers. Yeah. Um, if you want to send, send us an email, if you're a boomer and you want to yeah. send us an email... You can do so at comicgutter at gmail.com. Obviously, leave us a review. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.